Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Anindita Chakraborty, and I'm here to present the final briefing. On behalf of my team uh, working on forest um, conservation, forest governance, and conservation incentive schemes. So our client is the World Resources Institute. Um, WRI is a global research organization and a think tank that works on issues related to sustainable natural resource management practices. Um, their main areas of interest are in climate, food, transportation, and forests, among others. Um, we as a team are specifically working with their Global Forest Initiative program that seeks to address challenges caused by growing deforestation across the world. Um, more than a billion people are currently depend, uh, directly dependent on forest produce for their livelihoods. Despite our heavy reliance on forests, um, NASA predicts that if current deforestation rates are to continue, the world's rainforest will be completely gone in the next 100 years. Weak governance and insufficient incentive mechanisms drive many of these negative outcomes. WRI um, seeks to address these challenges by improving the design and implementation of forest conservation practices. We as a team uh, were tasked to look at why certain conservation schemes work while others don't. So there are many different types of conservation programs being implemented across the world right now. Uh, these range from government regulations aimed at curbing deforestation to private incentive schemes. The basic premise of a conservation incentive scheme is that ecosystem services have an economic value and once a financial or monetary value is placed on that ecosystem service, um, the idea is that investments would be attracted to maintain or restore that e uh, ecosystem service. Specifically, by assigning value to these services, the owner of the forest lands are then incentivized uh, to protect them, as well as uh, are brought into the fold of the negotiation process. So WRI wanted us to uh, assess the impacts of forest conservation schemes through the governance framework. They wanted us to see how these decisions uh, come to be made in the first place, but, and also what their structural components are. Because most conservation incentive schemes are contractual in nature, governance is extremely important to understand how property rights are defined and how these contracts can then be enforced. Uh, WRI has developed a global forest initiative framework tool uh, aimed to um, aid forest managers across the world assess impacts of their programs. So WRI's governance framework tool assesses programs through the lens of the five components of good governance, uh, which they look at through 122 indicators. We as a team um, pulled out these four thematic areas from the 122 indicators to assess the same. These include land tenure, adaptive management, participation, and monitoring capacity. And I will be elaborating on these later on in the presentation. We conducted our research in three phases. Um, firstly, we conducted an extensive literature review. Uh, this helped us inform and compile a database of 50 case studies from around the world. Uh, the database collected information on financial, non-financial, participatory, regulatory, and governance frameworks. Through this database then, and in consultation with our client, um, we uh, picked up uh, three regional case studies for in-depth research and review. These were from Indonesia, Madagascar, and Mexico. Uh, through the trends that we saw both from our database as well as in the case studies, we found some uh, overarching factors of success or enabling and limiting factors for a program success. All of these then fed into our policy recommendations. So the first key theme uh, that we found across the board were issues of land tenure. Land tenure uh, mostly just refers to ownership rights uh, that communities have to their forested lands. Uh, property rights directly determine who, uh, which communities are eligible to participate in conservation programs and thus receive benefits for their ecosystem services. So to highlight this, let's take a look at one of our case studies in Madagascar. Um, the map on your right um, shows the region in which <laughs> Madagascar's biodiversity protection program is currently being implemented. Um, the yellow region, which forms a big part of the total region, are state-protected and state-owned forests. So while in theory this might be a good idea for conservation, uh, 
simply because the government owns the land. In practice, it's not so. This is because there are very many communities who live in these lands who then have no incentive to um, conserve their forested lands, be a part of any conservation program, or receive any benefits for them. So Madagascar's biodiversity protection program aims to rectify this mistake by giving out limited ownership or access and management rights to these communities in exchange for more sustainable agricultural practices. The second key theme uh, is that of adaptive management. Um, designing programs with adaptive management structures allows for incorporating best practices and adjusting processes. If adjustment periods are formalized, then monitoring and evaluation mechanisms can serve to better focus the programs over time. So in a case in Mexico's uh, payment for hydrological services, we found that um, in this case, uh, the program underwent significant changes uh, since 2003 when it was first implemented. And this was done to incorporate um, certain uh, findings that external monitoring agencies had regarding um, identifying more high-risk areas uh, to increase participation rates as well as to increase poverty alleviation benefits uh, to communities. The third key theme was that of participation. Throughout our research, we found uh, that in cases whenever there was a top-down approach with external agencies trying to implement uh, however robust a program, the program ran into some challenges because it failed to take into consideration the interests and peculiarities of subgroups. Um, in Zimbabwe's forest protection program, for example, which was a Red Plus program, uh, the community not only participated in the initial um, workings of the program design process, but also that um, traditional and indigenous knowledge uh, played a pivotal role in formulating the policy itself. The last recurring theme is, is of um, monitoring capacity. We believe that monitoring is extremely critical to ensure uh, accountability and transparency. Uh, an interesting case was found in Indonesia's community forestry program. In this case, um, upstream farmers were compensated for replanting trees or reducing deforestation um, by a downstream hydroelectric dam. Uh, but in this case, the farmers were not paid an absolute value in terms of incentive, but was in direct proportion to the decreased sedimentation levels in the downstream hydroelectric dam. So by doing so, the monitoring was built into the program itself. Um, so all of these key themes helped inform our policy recommendations. We aim to create policy recommendations that are overarching for the design and implementation of programs uh, and can be implemented by policymakers, communities, or non-governmental organizations. Um, although we created more recommendations than these, for the purposes of this presentation, uh, these are the three themes. The first one being to require environmental and social baseline assessments, which in our opinion was uh, the biggest challenge to try and assess impacts of programs since no uh, baseline assessments were done. Second, to ensure that land tenure acquisition is a fundamental component, not just as a prerequisite, but can also be used as an incentive mechanism. And third, to secure robust monitoring and transparency systems again. Through our research of forest conservation incentive schemes, uh, we identified four key thematic areas. Uh, that are essential, in our opinion, to provide a foundation of good governance. By incorporating these best practices, we hope WRI and other organizations uh, can help develop stronger and more equitable programs as well. Uh, we look forward to presenting our recommendations and our findings to WRI in the next couple of weeks. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, that was an excellent uh, presentation. I just have a question. So you said you picked those four themes out of 100 and something of, I was just w wondering how you came about to pick those four out of so many, if it was maybe based on many case studies you had done, if that had informed that or something else. That's a good question. So um, we, uh, through our database and through our own research, we came out with these thematic areas. But since our client has also worked on this and has a framework, we went back to it and checked if there is any uh, similarity between their 122 indicators and our thematic areas, and there was. But just for brevity's sake, we kept it to four thematic areas. 
Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, just wanted to ask, you had four very good policy recommendations, um, but they all sound, firstly, quite expensive, uh, like, the, uh, like the monitoring and valuation. These are large areas that we're talking about in states that are often with poor uh, institutional capacities of their own. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you have any recommendations on how this is financeable or, or more feasible for, for, say, places like Madagascar or Brazil? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, that's a good question. So um, this is why I pointed out to the case in Indonesia, which I thought was a good way to not just have a monitoring capacity which comes in once in four years and which is um, not intrinsic to the program itself, uh, but it's something that communities themselves can do and have an incentive to do so that they can better judge the impact of the programs and have a stake in it, basically. Thank you.